Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to Arise Retirement Podcast. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Joining me today is Sean Shelton, partner at Moore Ingham Johnson Steel. Sean is uh, primarily works in the areas of estate tax uh, income planning, corporate tax planning. Uh, Sean, we've been working together for a while now. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for coming on to the podcast. This is your your first uh, go on the on the yes on Glad the wiser. To be here. Uh, a wiser retirement. We, I appreciate your time. Thank you. This is not billable time, is it? No, no. We're, not <laughs> <laughs> we're about to shut this uh, shut this down really fast. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, charitable trust, and we'll we'll kind of kind of branch off of that into some other things. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to create a scenario. We'll call them the Joneses because, you know, we all try to keep up with the Joneses, right? Right. So the Joneses have obviously done well because everybody's trying to be them. Uh, and let's say that they have amassed uh, an estate well above the exclusion. So when we talk about an exclusion, we're talking about an uh, estate for husband and wife uh, that's worth more than $25 million. Right. So above $25 million, you pass away. Anything above that mark today, um, you're going to pay or the state the estate would pay um, a death tax. Right. Federal estate tax uh, at 40% of the excess. Um, and so, yeah, that right now that number is around 25 million. It's 12.92 million per person. So mm-hmm. for a married couple that gets it up around 25, actually close to 26. There's, if there's no changes in the law, there's a potential or there is a decrease that would come into effect January 1st, 2026. And we don't know exactly where the number is going to end up because uh, it's it's indexed for inflation. But basically, right now, the base amount is $10 million, and the inflation adjustments have gotten it up to 12.92. In 2026, the base amount goes from $10 million to $5 million. Mm-hmm. But you still have all the inflation adjustments, so it's probably going to end up, you know, anywhere from 65 to $7.5 million per person. Uh, so then, you know, uh, you'd be talking about anybody with an estate over 14 or 15 million could be looking at potential estate tax liability. And that 40, that 40%, that, I mean, that's a lot of money. It's pretty steep. Yeah. yeah. And then some people live in states where they also have a state, uh, a state death tax. We don't have that in Georgia. Correct. We do not have that in Georgia. And I think there's only a few left that have uh, that state Death Northeast tax. and Northwest. Connecticut believe, right? was one of them. Uh, yeah. I don't remember the Washington others. state, I believe. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ho- hopefully you're not in that situation. Uh, cause sometimes those are well below the, um, the federal, right. Numbers. Their exemptions may be different, yeah, lower like million, uh, 2 million. Who even. knows? Mm-hmm. All right. So we're in this scenario. Uh, the Joneses are, uh, they all, they have, uh, assets that have highly appreciated, if I get that out right, yep. assets that have highly appreciated, uh, that'd be like buying Apple stock as an IPO yep. <laughs> in the 80s and they mm-hmm. sat on it, right? Or UPS or Home Depot, one it, of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or even a business that has um, highly appreciated in, mm-hmm. in its value. Um, and then they, um, real estate, keep going down the list. <laughs> um, they're very they're very charitable. They're, they want to help others. They they have uh, plenty of resources for themselves. Um, and ultimately, they're coming to us and saying, hey, we know we're over the exclusion. We need to do some estate planning. Uh, what do you suggest? So one of the options, and I guess the one that we're sort of focused on today, it was a what's called a charitable remainder trust, where they take some of those low basis assets and they transfer them to an irrevocable trust. And this charitable remainder trust, this is in the internal revenue code. Uh, there's actually formed form trust documents that have been prepared by the IRS. It's what's called a split interest trust where you have a lead beneficiary who receives an income stream either for a period of years, up to 20 years or for the life of an individual. And then a remainder beneficiary that gets it when that period ends or when that life ends. So with a charitable remainder trust, the remainder beneficiary is a charity. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And the lead beneficiary is usually the grantor, the person that's setting up the trust. So they can take some of these low basis, highly appreciated assets, transfer them to the trust, and the trust itself is tax exempt. So the trust can then diversify that portfolio, sell the assets without having to immediately pay income tax on it. Uh, the income tax doesn't go away because there's also a stream of income that, that is paid out to the grantor. Uh, and we can do it as an annuity trust or a unit trust. An annuity mm -hmm. trust, it's a fixed dollar amount uh, from the trust every year that doesn't change. With a unit trust, it's a fixed percentage of the value of the trust assets, and you have to revalue the trust assets every year. So it may increase or decrease depending on the investment performance in the trust itself. So when you liquidate that portfolio and the trust diversifies, the trust itself doesn't pay income tax, but the distributions that are going out to the grantor uh, or the lead beneficiary, those are includable in their income. And then the nature of that income depends on the nature of the income for the trust. So it's first ordinary income up to any income, ordinary income received by the trust. And then it goes to capital gains. Mm -hmm. And then anything above that would be return of basis. That's not taxable typically. So if we had real estate inside the trust and it was generating real real estate income from rents, that would be taxed as income as, as the Ordinary income stream income. comes out to the Joneses. Mm -hmm. But if they had stock and they sold the stock and there was capital gains, mm -hmm. then it would come out as capital gains. Right. So if you did kind of a mix, I guess, uh, you know, if you funded this charitable remainder trust with a combination of rental property and a low basis portfolio of publicly traded securities, and let's say you've got uh, uh, the numbers work out that you've got a hundred thousand dollar distribution to the grand tour. The rental income is fifty thousand. That yeah. first fifty thousand is ordinary income, and then if there's capital gains from that portfolio in excess of fifty thousand, then the next fifty thousand would also be ordinary income. And that just kind of goes on until you've, you know, if you have an ordinary income every year, then you're going to have some of that for the grand tour every yeah. year. You're going to use, you may use up the capital gains over time. Is there a formula for how much income has to come out? There is a requirement that the remainder value of the trust has to be at least 10% of the initial contributed property. Okay. And when I say the present value of the remainder interest that's going to go to the charity has to be at least 10% of what's put in. So if you're putting in a okay. million dollars, the present value of that remainder interest has to be at least a uh, hundred thousand. The payout amount uh, can be anywhere from 5% to 50%. Okay. And just, you kind of work those numbers and, and part of that's up to the client. A lot of times we're just trying to maximize the income. So we'll go as high as we can and satisfy that 10% test. Okay. Uh, if they're not as concerned about the income stream, uh, then you may back off that a little bit and, uh, go for a higher remainder interest and the, t the tax deduction, you do get a tax deduction, an immediate tax deduction right. based on the present value of that remainder interest, when you fund the trust. Uh, so you may want to, you so know, you get a tax deduction based on the 10% of correct. the million dollars. Maybe you put into it. Correct. And you know, there's limitations on that because the other portion could be pulled back out. Well, yeah, uh, the, yeah, through the income stream, through the income stream, you're going to get the rest of that, uh, theoretically, uh, over yeah. the life of that trust. But um, you're not paying any more tax. And if you just kept it yourself, no. Uh, and, and probably, if you were planning to sell it anyway, you'd end up paying less tax or at least deferring the tax. So, yeah. uh, you know, if I had a million dollar asset with a $500,000 basis, I've got a $500,000 capital gain that if I sell it, I'm going to pay tax on it roughly, you know, somewhere 25 to 30% probably yeah. uh, on that 500,000. If you put it into the trust, uh, you can take back the income stream. You may still end up paying close to the same amount in taxes, but you may spread it over. Yeah, that's years. true because it kind of hides inside the inside the charitable remainder and, trust until you until withdraw you receive it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that could you could delay that for up to twenty years. It sounds like. Well, uh, and or, you can you can do a lifetime distribution on the trust, okay. but it's just uh, it, it depends on how long it takes to push all that gain out to you based on right. uh, what's the amount of the annuity or what's the amount of the unit trust payment each year and what was the total gain on the and then, assets. And then you pass away and these these assets are now considered outside your estate. So if we were we had a net worth of thirty million, we put five million into this charitable remainder trust, mm -hmm. the Joneses, um, and they would receive an income stream off that five million dollars. Mm -hmm an immediate tax deduction of 10%. So $500,000 tax deduction, right? right? At least, yeah, at least. possibly more. 
uh, and then they pass away and there wouldn't be death tax on the assets in the trust on the assets inside the trust. So if nothing else had appreciated in value, then they wouldn't have any death tax at that point. Yeah. If we get the estate below the exemption by doing that. uh, And when they move the assets to to the charitable trust, are we, do we have to drop our exemption in any way? No, it's not a, it's not a, as long as the person setting it up. So if the grantor is the one that's receiving the unit trust or annuity payments, uh, there's no gift. There would only be a, a gift that you would apply to the exemption if they're naming somebody else. So if I set this up and fund the trust with a $5 million, but I name my daughter as the uh, lead beneficiary, Got I've it. made a gift to her based on, and the, and it's valued based on what's the present value of that anticipated yeah. income stream. Okay. Uh, but if, and in most cases, the grantor, the one who's setting it up is the one who also receives the income payments. So there's no gift at formation. Okay. So we have $5 million inside a trust. All that money, except for the income, would be going to the charity. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. If I only deducted 10%, I died the day after I signed the documents. (laughs) Is... It didn't work as well as it could have, probably, <laughs> okay. but uh, it's not a total loss. Because you, 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 you're saving 40% on the death tax. Yeah, you've removed that asset uh, from the estate, so you saved the, the 40%. And this kind of ties into uh, what you and I were talking about a little before we started, that one option to try and alleviate that or re- replace the value of that asset that you're getting out of your estate would be to take some or all of the income stream that's generated by that charitable remainder trust. Yeah. Use that to purchase a life insurance policy. And if you put the life insurance policy in an irrevocable trust, uh, the policy itself will be out of your estate. So if I take a $5 million asset and I transfer it to the charitable remainder trust and I take the income stream and the income stream is enough to fund the premium on a, preferably a second to die policy on myself and my wife. Yeah. And I have that policy owned by a trust and it purchases a $5 million policy. Uh, then at my death, that $5 million in the life insurance trust is available for my family. Even if I die three tax, days after I set it tax up. Free, tax free, not part free, of your estate. Not included in your estate. Yeah. And this is the only time. It took 180 episodes, Sean. <laughs> 180 <laughs> episodes of our podcast for me to agree that a permanent life insurance policy might be a <laughs> good <sense>. idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Because you wouldn't be funding that with term. <laughs> no, uh, probably not. Uh, and you also have to have decent enough health to get the whole life or the, or, the, or the universal life. Right. right. You, you have to be in, uh, you have to be insurable, as yes. they say. Uh, but again, and, and, uh, and, you know, I have a background in insurance somewhat, so I may uh, talk a little more about this than I should. But with a married couple, they don't both have to be in good health. Uh, you know, when you're insuring two lives, it's easier if it, even if one how one spouse is unhealthy or would be uninsurable on their own, you yeah. can still get a policy on that covers both of them without it being second to die policy. Right. Yeah. And that's honestly, that's the best fit for estate tax purposes, because uh, and we didn't talk much about this for a married couple. You can usually defer any estate taxes until the death of the second spouse between the available exemption and the fact that you get a 100 percent deduction for property that passes to your spouse. You're not going to owe any estate tax until the second death anyways. So a yeah. second to die policy can really make sense for that reason. So even if you're not charitable, because we, we, we're trying to figure out who who's the candidate for this over the exclusion I think is a, is a good candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, charitable being charitable. I think being charitable is important. And like you said, it may not be absolutely necessary, but I think it's a harder sell for somebody that's not already uh, interested in supporting uh, some charitable organizations. Yeah. Uh, so over the exemption uh, has a, uh, a highly appreciated asset or portfolio that they may be looking to diversify uh, a little bit. And that also has, you know, I think uh, the potential for, significant gain of the future, um, on that yep. portfolio, uh, that would just add to, you know, if it continues to grow, it's just going to add to their estate tax problem. Yeah, absolutely. So then there's a whole another component to this is you might say, well, man, that's a lot of money to give to one organization. Obviously you can name multiple organizations that right. would be the beneficiaries of that. But what if, what if, instead of going to that single organization, you use something like the Cobb Community Collaborative and it went into a donor advised fund. Yep, you can do that. So, and then uh, 
uh, I believe you can, you know, you can set it up that way and then you can even designate the family members or whoever you want to act as the board or the trustees for that fund mm-hmm. uh, so that after your death, when the property goes to the foundation, uh, they're able to uh, make recommendations as far as who the, who the grants should go to, who the, act- the actual charities that should benefit from that money. Yeah. So now you have a family board as part of the donor advised fund. Now that that money has, can't go to uncle Harry and his uh, scholarship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it has, has to go to a, qualified charities. Yeah. 501 C three IRS qualified charities. But that money uh, at that point, you're really leaving a legacy. We talk about legacy mm-hmm. here all the time, but you're li- really leaving a legacy of uh, family members taking that asset and then helping other uh, nonprofits. Right. And that money could be invested still inside, um, like a traditional, you know, index portfolio. Right. Family and, members could continue to contribute to it if yeah. they want to. So yeah. Yeah. Like you said, I think, uh, it, building a legacy of family involvement in philanthropy, philanthropy uh, yes. and, and other things. So, all right. So that, that, that was quick. We got through that. Uh, now we're now experts in charitable uh, well, remainder no, no, that trust. Wasn't a, that wasn't a deep dive, <laughs> but we covered kind of the basics. Well, what, what? How many hours does it take typically to to build something like this? I mean, uh, are for we, me? Uh, well, I'm not necessarily looking for what the cost is, but I'm more of like how many meetings? Like how many? You know, what's what's a person's journey? to get through all this. Cause you have your other estate that's a part of this too. So you mm-hmm. have to kind of look at the whole picture. This so, is not a come in set up over one meeting. This is probably what four or five meetings. Right. And I'd say this is probably not the first thing you're going to do. So the first thing we would do is we would meet and, and talk about what I would call your foundational documents and make sure we've got uh, a will in place or a revocable trust. And for somebody with a taxable estate that, in, that builds in uh, some tax planning uh, like I was talking about earlier, to make sure that any taxes that are due would be deferred if they're married until the death of the second spouse. Yeah. Get that in place along with things like a power of attorney and a healthcare directive. And this is more in the category of advanced planning that you turn to once you've done all that. And then we start looking at how can we reduce the estate if they're over the exemption to try and get it uh, below that exemption amount. So then, yeah, it would be, you know, we'd have uh, probably... Once we get those foundational documents, there would be a separate meeting to talk about the charitable trust. Um, how much are we looking to fund in there? What sort of asset are they putting in there? And a lot of that, they're determining. I may help them kind of figure out, but there's usually, you know, an asset that they have in mind. Like you said, they, that concentrated position in uh, one stock that they bought in an IPO 20, 30 years ago uh, that's appreciated greatly. Yeah. That they're worried about, you know, if they sell it, they're going to take a big tax hit. Uh, and look at, you know, okay, well, that's what we're planning for. This is what we're going to fund the trust with. And then we start looking at the mechanics of the trust and saying, okay, do we want it to be, uh, is it going to be a period of time? I guess you can do up to 20 years as a, as a fixed period, or do you want it to be for life that yep. they're continuing to receive that payout? And then I'd say that's probably the most common. You see the uh, unit trust or annuity trust payments coming back to the grand tour for life. Then we run some calculations and figure out what's the payout percentage that we can use that will satisfy that 10% requirement and make sure we leave the 10% to the charity and then start, you know, uh, put, put a draft of the trust together. Uh, maybe let them review it, see if maybe have another meeting to go over it and, and address any questions they have and then, you know, get it signed and get, uh, uh, get everything transferred into the name of the trust. We're going to see, um, I think in the future, at least in our client base, probably really large IRAs. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any way to have IRA money or IRA funds end up in a charitable remainder trust? I don't, I don't think you could do it without taking it out of the IRA first and paying the income taxes. But I think a better way to achieve charitable planning with the IRA would just be to name a charity as a beneficiary mm-hmm. of the IRA. Cause then, you know, if you name, uh, your spouse still has the ability, if your spouse is the beneficiary of an IRA, to stretch that money out over their life expectancy right. and continue the tax deferral. So I think uh, I tell people you still want your spouse as the primary beneficiary on those right. kinds of accounts. But uh, if your spouse predeceases you and you're wanting to direct some money to charity, it's a good way to do it is to name a charity as a, you know, maybe a partial beneficiary on the IRA because the charity doesn't have to worry about all those tax issues yeah. that come with inheriting the IRA. They <laughs> True. They don't have to pull the money out within 
10 years, then they don't have to pay tax on it. They can take it all. Uh, so you're, you know, you're benefiting the charity more um, yeah. than a, a, you know, just an individual who receives it and has to pay all the tax on that. Yeah. And you do have the option with your required minimum distributions up to a hundred thousand dollars can go directly to charity and not be counted towards your income. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's but, true. But, but that's, that's, um, that's for a charitable person. If a person just is, believes the charity starts at home as I've hear some of our clients say, <laughs> um, if, if you're not charitable, charitably inclined, um, you're probably not giving away the money therefore you're gonna pay tax and, and, and reinvest that money back into your brokerage account or right. into something else. Or give it to family or something like you said. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so really, you know, there's really no way to shelter that and, you know, because even in this other in charitable remainder trust, you still have the, that life insurance option. So you know that you're still making your family a whole. You didn't give away their inheritance, right? Right. Again, and it may not always be an option because I guess it's, it is dependent on are you in good enough health that uh, you can you can get that insurance policy. Right. Uh, but yeah, there's a ways to, you know, and, and that may be a factor in considering it, that if, the, if they're really concerned about, well, I don't want to do it if I can't get that insurance policy, then we would kind of do it in tandem, get them underwritten, see if we can qualify for a policy before we kind of pull the trigger on, on yeah. doing the charitable remainder trust in the first place. And uh, I guess going back to your question about the process, we would probably also pull in, you know, you as their financial advisor and their accountant uh, to look at it uh, just from a purely tax income tax standpoint and make sure, you know, see if they uh, have any suggestions or, or options uh, to consider in setting up. So uh, that would be a concern partly because, and I don't, don't know if we well I think we did mention this when you create and fund the charitable remainder trust you get an immediate tax deduction based on the remainder value that's going to go to the charity there's some limitations on how much of that deduction you can take take each year based on your AGI yeah. but you get the ability to you, you carry it forward for up to five, up to 5 years so that's where the CPA would come in we would kind of look at well what's your income been historically are you going to be able to use up all of that uh, deduction within the 5 years things like that and then hopping, uh, uh, same topic, you know, different rabbit. <laughs> uh, you think about the donor advised funds. We, we have several um, podcasts we've done on donor advised funds, but specifically you don't have to be over the exclusion to participate in a donor advised fund. That's for any family who wants to do that. I think that's the beauty of donor advised funds is they're really easy to set up. Um, you don't have to have a lot of money. You can do them with five or $10,000. So yep. it's a, it's an easy way to get started in that charitable area without spending a lot of money uh, to set something up. So that's for really, for the most part, everyday, everyday clients, at least at our firm, that all, all of our clients could go and fund something like that. And what I like about it is a lot of grandparents have done it and they basically assign grandchildren I think they realized they forgot to teach their kids to be charitable. <laughs> <laughs> so they're working on that next generation. Right. Uh, but at around Thanksgiving time, they say, Hey, the, the funds earned X amount of dollars. We need to find, you know, three grandkids, three, three organizations that you want to support. Cause right. you're kind of making you a board member of, of this five uh, unofficially mm -hmm. of, of, of the donor advised fund, which I think is neat to see that process. Um, so let's talk about, uh, let's go really big here for a minute. And, and, let's say that we're well over the exclusion. Um, at what point do you just create your own family foundation? You know, and I was thinking about that too. That is kind of a, an alternative to the donor advised fund, but it does take more significant assets. I think, you know, if you're over the exemption and you're charitably inclined, I don't, I don't know that there is a specific number, but those are um, more expensive to set up. You know, you're forming an entity. You got to apply for, tax exempt status with the IRS. There's annual filings and maintenance uh, related to a private foundation. So, you know, I'd say a million dollars are up probably to, to even uh, think about that. it probably. Yeah. Um, but the benefit is, you know, the donor advised funding, you can involve the family, but they're not getting compensated with a private foundation. It's, it's your, it's a, it's a corporation. Uh, and it has a board of directors that can be compensated. Uh, and there's, Additional requirements on a donor or on a private foundation, you have to make grants each year equal to 5% of the, the value of the assets. And right. uh, like I said, there's, there's uh, even though it's not paying taxes, there's still IRS filings that are needed well, every year. public and private foundations. And most of the two time, classifications, right? Right. Uh, and most of the time, what we would be talking about would be a private foundation, that it's all the money's coming from 
one individual or one family to, to create this charitable entity. And then the family stays involved, like I said, acting as the board and directing yeah. those, uh, those annual grants that are made. So, yeah. And those can live, uh, forever, very, very, very long yeah. time. Um, yeah, I'm on the board up at Barry college on the board of visitors. And I think time flies, especially as I get older, <laughs> it just moves faster, but I know it's within the last five years. Uh, I know that the Ford foundation, had um, done a lot of repair to the buildings that Mr. Ford had originally built okay. on the property, mm-hmm. which is, which is pretty cool as a maintaining his legacy, literally uh, his vision and yeah. Martha Berry's vision mm-hmm. um, being able to then come back and, and maintain that like literally the rock on the side of the building, which mm-hmm. is, which is pretty cool. Uh, but you don't have to have Ford kind of money necessarily to, to have a private foundation. No, I I don't think you need, you know, tens of millions of dollars. It can be done. Right. uh, And, and theoretically it could be done with less than a million, but I just don't think you, there's a cost benefit analysis there as to. The donor advised funds now are just make it so easy. Right. Um, It's hard, hard for me to believe that you wouldn't want to do that. But in a private foundation, if you wanted to give money directly to someone to go to school, well, it, you kind of have to avoid that. There's still limitations on that. So you can't set it up, you know, and primarily for the benefit of individual family members or things like no, that. No, no, no. But if, if you want to start your own scholarship to something, you could just do that, right? Right. You could. You, you have less less um, criteria than you do in the donor advised fund. Uh, as long as it's not self-benefiting. Right. Uh, and most, and I think you still have, so even if you're doing stuff like that, if you're, if you're a private foundation, you yeah. still got to be making grants to other charities that's primarily what they they're kind of just a pass through that you, you know gotcha which is the public ones you can give it to individual people uh is that yeah that? It, well or there's and we're getting into stuff that i don't you, know as well yeah as should, so. I, i've been a part of a couple of smaller private foundations yeah and i know that that's something that we had to change and um, there's there's a you know i think a point where like i said a private foundation it's it, partly it's about where the money's coming from a private foundation is usually created and funded by a single person single, or a single person, family. Right. when you get into a public charity that's where you're doing more public fundraising and you're getting a large portion of your donations yeah. from the general public. Um, and then you have, uh, uh, another one that I don't know much about, which will be a public operating foundation or I'm, or I'm sorry, a private operating foundation, uh, where it's a private foundation, but it does engage in some more of those direct charitable activities. So ultimately there's a lot of charitable options mm-hmm. for people. Um, even especially over the exclusion to keep the money out of the government's hands and, put it into the hands of people who actually need it would just some, take some forethought and some planning, but also maintain a little, on. uh, control. And, and I guess we didn't talk too much about that, but with the, the charitable remainder trust, uh, the grantor, again, the person setting up that trust, a lot of times can act as the trustee. So they're managing mm-hmm. those investments within the trust, uh, while they are receiving the income distributions and, uh, have a little bit more control or, you know, I guess control, maybe the, the wrong word. They can't, they don't have complete control over it, but they can still manage how manage it's invested. It. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've got to make those payments every year. There is some work involved sometimes, you know, uh, again, with the unit trust, uh, you've got to be able to value at assets every year. Uh, there's different options for hard to value assets where you can do a, a net income crut, uh, where if you're putting in something that's, you know, illiquid, uh, and I guess the classic example would be Valuable works of art or a business or something like that, where you set it up where the, the payout is based on the net income generated. Uh, so in those initially until that asset is sold, there's very little coming out on distributions. And then when it's sold, you kind of make up for the, for the missed distributions and just keep going from there. Right. Uh, there's other variations where it can flip from a net income type situation to a, a typical crut upon the, a, a, a charitable remainder unit trust upon the occurrence of some event, Um, so yeah, there's, uh, and that's the kind of thing that as part of the process, we can sit down and talk about what's going to work best. Is it going to be a straight charitable remainder annuity trust or a straight charitable remainder unit trust? Or are we going to do one of those other options? And a lot of that would depend on what's the asset they're looking at to fund this vehicle. Um, Thank you. We could sit here and talk for probably hours on, day, on yeah. all different kinds of top uh, legal topics. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's wrap it here. Um, Sean, if people want to work with you, how do they contact you? Uh, you can get to me. My, my direct office phone number is 770-795-5077 or email sgshelton 
at mijs.com. Thank you for your hard work and certainly your um, loyalty to wiser clients. So I don't think we've had one single complaint. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it stays that way. Five so stars. We'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, fun. thanks for being on here. Um, you know, we, we have a couple episodes. If you want to learn more about estate planning, uh, episode 120, finding the right estate planning attorney for you. Episode 116, are you striving to leave a purposeful legacy? Uh, we also have our YouTube channel called A Wiser Retirement. What is the role of a trustee uh, and to prevent family conflict in legacy planning? These are all in the show notes. You, you can direct a link there. Uh, thanks for listening to this, today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management, want to schedule a consultation, meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com or you can click on the link uh, in the, in the uh, episode notes. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or a solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.